Hello, again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network, brought to you, of course, by the good folks at Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. As we uh, come your way on a Friday podcast, obviously, uh, the talk is centering around the Rangers, who are now in great shape. And kudos to Joe McLeady. If you listen to him, in the podcast we did before the Ranger series, everything he said in the series has been true. He said they were going to use two goalies. They have. They were going to have a problem with their goalies. They have. He said the Rangers' biggest problem would be five on five. He was right about that, too. He said the special teams would be the difference. It has been. Um, He even talked about the guy who's been the biggest scorer for Carolina, he even uh, hit on that. Uh, So, I mean, really he has, his analysis was so good. It was scary. That's how, that's how good it was. Uh, We'll have him back when they play the next round, whether it's Florida or Boston, Uh, I'm moving the Rangers ahead at three to love. Uh, Obviously they have another game to win. Who knows? It might take a couple of games. Maybe Carolina wins the fourth. Maybe they win the fifth. Maybe they are a thorn in the side in the Rangers for a couple of games before they win it. But the Rangers, the way they're going right now, it doesn't look like Carolina can even go on the power play. If they do, the Rangers are going to score on them. I mean, it's, it's gotten crazy. Uh, and the Rangers are in their heads right now. They really are. I mean, they just, they, they, if you look at one team, and I know they're a very good team, Carolina. Okay. And I know the game's been close, but right now the Rangers are in a command. There's almost, they're in a commanding position. I think almost mentally against the team right now. They just don't seem comfortable. They don't seem comfortable on the power play. They don't seem comfortable against the Rangers right now. They really don't. And, uh, you know, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, watch out. And right now the Rangers are in that position. Uh, Boston, Florida look like they're gearing down as we get ready for game three in that series. 1-1 looks like we're gearing and getting ready for a long series. And we'll see where that takes us. Uh, But right now the Rangers are flying high. Now, Knicks or the story as they go into uh, Indiana and upset Indiana, that's fine. Listen, what Carlisle's doing, folks, is what every coach from Pat Riley to Phil Jackson to any NBA coach going back to the days of Bill Fitch or wherever you want to go, it's about trying to set the officials up for the next game. That's all it is. It's not him being a baby. It's not him doing, hey, first of all, I have never in my life seen an official call a double dribble and then take it back, okay? Whether it was a double dribble or not, if you call it, you don't take it back. I mean, he called a double dribble and then took it back at a pivotal part of the game. If I was the coach, I'd be nuts too. You would too. That was crazy. I've never seen that in my life. It was just a bad piece of officiating. And he was backed off by the other officials uh, who probably should have let the call stand just because it was the right, you know, it's what you would expect there. Uh, They took it back was crazy. I mean, I've never seen that. But Indiana is going to be in a very, very uh, intense mood tonight. You know that. Uh, they feel like they should have won at least one of the games. They can't feel like they should have won the second game because they got barely outplayed in the second half. Um, Now the Knicks come into this, and let's be honest, when is enough enough? They now don't have OG. He has been along with what Brunson's done with his scoring, what Hart and D. Vincenzo have done with their Iron Man acts especially hot. Um, and don't take anything away from Dante. Dante has been superb in the series. Um, and he really got it going in the third quarter the other day. Um, he, he lit the spark. Uh, they now don't have OG probably definitely for games three and four, probably for the rest of the series. I don't know if he'll be back before the middle of the next round. If he comes back at all this year, I don't know how bad this hamstring is. Uh, I know that people who saw it were saying it was significant. The word we were hearing right away was it was significant. If it's significant, it's weeks. 
So he's not there. So right now you have, in the Nick rotation, six players. Put Burks in the rotation, even though they don't want him. That's seven, of which he really wants to go only six deep. And now you have the Brunson issue, where you don't know how bad the foot is. We don't know. Now, you don't ever want to give up a playoff game, ever. But there's also a part of this that gets to a point where it's smart. If he would be aided by rest, if he would be helped significantly by rest, I wouldn't play Brunson tonight. Now, I don't know that he's going to be significantly helped by rest. I'm not even sure we know what the injury really is. They might not tell us the truth at this point of the season. They don't, I don't feel they have to, they, I don't feel they have to be compelled to be open about that. They have to be open about whether he's going to play or not. They don't have to be open about what his injury is. They don't owe us anything. So maybe it's a sprained foot. Maybe it's a serious sprained foot. Maybe it's not a badly sprained foot. I don't know what it is. He plays, he plays. He doesn't play, he doesn't play. He played the second half. He scored 24 points in the second half, so he was feeling okay. He went to the ground on numerous occasions, and he got back up every time. Now, is he going to go tonight? I don't know. Is he going to go a lot of minutes tonight? I don't know. In the third quarter, if Indiana opens up an 18-point lead, does Tibbs say, you know what? I'll see you Sunday and take all the starters out of the game and put in the scrubs and play the rest of the game with the back of the bench and give Hart some rest and Dante some rest and Brunson some rest and Hartenstein some rest. I don't know. That's why this game tonight, from a standpoint of anything except it's a free game if you can get it. It's not logical that you would get it. I did a, they asked me to do a uh, same game parlay. I had to do it on Indiana tonight. I can't, I could, I can't in good conscience tell you to bet the Knicks tonight. I don't think the Knicks will win tonight. If Indiana doesn't win tonight, they should be ashamed of themselves, to be honest with you. I mean, they're playing against six players of which we don't know the status of their number one player. And OG is a, Enormous loss. Not a little loss, an enormous loss. You just took one of the core. You just took a chair that has four legs and took one of the legs out. It's going to wobble. They're going to wobble. If OG doesn't come back, this series is in question. And then throw in Brunson's injury and the series really, even though it's 2 nothing, could easily come back here for a pivotal game five with no OG and hurting Brunson and the Knicks in trouble. It, it could definitely be that way. Hey, injuries are part of the game. Going back to whenever, going back to the days of Willis Reed, going back to the series where DeBusha was hurt one year and it hampered the Knicks, and Havlicek was hurt another year, and it hampered the Celtics. It happens. Guys get hurt. There's nothing you can do about it. You play the guys you can play, and you play your healthy players. That's all you can do. If Brunson's able to play, he's able to play. Case closed. Now, if Brunson's capable of going out there and scoring 30-plus points tonight, if he is, which wouldn't shock any of us, can they win the game with six players? Very difficult, sure. They're going up against an Indiana team that plays nobody more than 36 minutes. They go nine deep. The nine guys play within play anywhere from 14, which is a low, to a high of 36 minutes. They have outscored the Knicks on the bench 46-3 in the first game, 46-12 in the second game. They have been destroyed by McConnell, who is going to see main, meaningful minutes in the fourth quarter of the game tonight. You can take it to the bank. I think you will see him and Halliburton playing together. Obi Toppin has killed them. He's averaged 16 points a game 
on a high shooting percentage. Same thing with McConnell is shooting well over 50% and has 15 assists in two games, averaging 22 minutes a night. He has 14 points and and seven assists in 20 minutes of play. You got two guys coming off the bench. One's averaging 14, one's averaging 16. And they're playing 20 minutes apiece. The bench has scored 46 points in each of the first two games. No reason to be any different tonight. Now, in game two, they got a terrible game out of Siakam. He shot seven for 18. Plus, Siakam in his last five playoff games is four for 14 from the foul line. It is, it is in his head. Do not be afraid to send him to the line. He can't make a free throw right now. And as a matter of fact, Indiana bombs from the foul line in the fourth quarter, which killed them the other night. You cannot go in a playoff game and miss five straight free throws. Maybe you can if it's Will Chamberlain. You can if you're somebody else. Siakam had a terrible game. Miles had a turn. Miles Turner had a terrible game. Three for eleven from the floor did nothing. Um, Nesmith had a terrible game. Expect big games from all three of them tonight. Expect Turner to bounce back. He had 23 in game one. You'll get a game more like that than you got in game two. Expect Siakam to get over 20 points tonight. Uh, Go to his post-ups. Expect their other guards. Expect Nesmith and, uh, and really everybody in that rotation to have a good game tonight. That's what happens when you get home. And their guys have scored throughout the series. I mean, the bench has scored 46 points in each of the first two games. Shepard's averaging, I mean, if you go McConnell, Toppin, and Shepard, they're averaging 40 points a game off the bench. That's crazy. That's just, you know, that's crazy good. And the Knicks have got Ironman here. While nobody on... Indiana's played more than 36 minutes in either game. The Knicks have got guys playing. Hart's played 48 minutes each game. Dante's played 45 minutes each game. And OG and Brunson, if it weren't for injuries, would have both logged 44, 45 minutes in each game. That's four guys logging 44-plus minutes while they don't have one guy playing anywhere near 40 minutes out of the whole squad. That has got to start to take its toll. Then he throw in the possibility of foul trouble, which Hardstein can't get in foul trouble tonight or Chua because they have no replacements. So she's going to go really deep on the bench now. You play McBride, you can squeeze Burks in. I mean, he got a cameo the other night. If you go more, if you go any deeper than that, you're really in trouble. So this has now reached a dire strait for Tibbs. He's got no Robinson. He's got no Bogdanovich. He's got no OG. He's got six guys. And Brunson's, I don't know how many minutes you want to log with him tonight. You're going to ask him for 45 minutes on on that uh, foot? I don't know if you can. So the question you're asking now, with OG out of both games, with Brunson hurting, is is it possible for the Knicks to squeeze a game out of Indiana? Can they get a win in one of these two games? Or are they going to come back 2-2 and wondering about what their status is in game five? I mean, logic would dictate that Indiana is going to come back 2-2. Considering the fact OG's not going to play any of the game. Considering the fact we don't know how healthy Brunson is. It's going to be very hard to win these games. If they win one, you'd, you'd be, you know, astounded. If they won both, you'd be, you'd have to ask for an investigation. If you won, if you, if you, they win one, you'll be astounded. Especially since OG's not, OG's not going to play the game, from what we understand. 
Um, so this Nick team, which has continued to just overwhelm us with how tough they are and how resilient they are and how good they are at coming back in these games and getting it out of somebody. I don't think you can ask them to reach deeper on the bench and ask these guys to come in and, you know, put up great performances. I, I think that's asking too much. And they've been a different team when OG hasn't been in the lineup. When OG and Brunson have been healthy since OG, since the trade, when Brunson and OG have been healthy in the lineup, the Knicks haven't lost. They've lost only a couple of games. And they have gotten outstanding. I mean, forget what they've gotten out of Brunson, but they have gotten outstanding performances out of OG, out of Dante, out of, of course, Iron Man Hart, and Hartenstein, who has had a really a wonderful series and has made himself a ton of money going forward. If the Knicks want to keep him, it is going to cost them now significant money to keep him. I mean, he has made himself a very valuable commodity. And let's be honest, he can handle it. He gets to the ball in the fourth quarter. He is a terrific passer. He advances the ball. He moves it along. He has good hands. He, uh, he really passes the ball well, and he drops that shot. It might bounce around the rim three or four times, but it drops in. He drops that shot. I'll tell you, he hits every part of the rim with it, and then it goes in. Really, he's become... And, you know, sometimes I hear criticism of Tibbs from even Nick fans. They don't like his rotations. They don't like this. They don't like that. Hey, it is not a coincidence that every guy they bring here gets better. That is not coincidence. That is player development. That is coaching. That is understanding about putting players in the right role and asking them to do the things that they do well. I mean, when you see how far Hart has elevated his game, even from the regular season where he became such an important cog in what the Knicks did to now what he's done in these playoff games is mind boggling. But Hartenstein, Achua, McBride, even Dante, who, listen, Dante's, oh, I've always been a Dante guy. I've loved him since he was at Villanova because he had an explosive nature and quality even there where he would come in. He was never afraid to take the shot. Even if he was going to be cold, it didn't matter. He, you know, he's always going to make the next one. And I love guys like that. He's a, he's a guy who can miss five in a row and he will stand up there and take the next big shot. Cause he believes in his heart. He's going to make it. And those guys are irrepressible. They really are. And he's one of those guys. He's not a guy who caves in and you see the guys in the league all of a sudden, right, they miss the first two, and all of a sudden, they don't want to find the ball. They're hiding from the ball. They don't want to present themselves in the corner for that open three. They don't want to get – as soon as they get the ball, it's like a hot potato. Boom, boom, it's gone because they don't want any part of it. They don't want the responsibility to shoot that ball. Well, Dante will never back down from that ball, ever. He might not make the shot, but you know what? He believes he's going to make the shot. And that's a lot of it. And that's what he is. And you take his explosiveness, his ability to go to the basket, the way he can pass, the hustle he gives you, the way he can jump. I mean, he's an exciting player. He always has been. I remember he had a game that stamped him a hero forever at Villanova with what he did to rescue a championship. And... I said, Harrison and I were watching the game on uh, the other night, on Thursday, on Wednesday night, and I said to him at half, I said, hey, you know, Dante's going to have to put a minimum of 20 in the second half. Now, I never knew Brunson was going to come back and have that half, obviously. 
But I'm like, if they're going to stay in the game, Dante's going to have to go wild here in the second half. He only had eight at the half. As a matter of fact, he had three, and then he scored five late in the first half. And he came out in the third quarter, and boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, he winds up with 28 points. So not only did not only did Brunson get 24 in the second half, but Dante got 20 in the second half. And that was enormous in that game. Big basket after big basket after big basket in that third quarter when they turned the game around. But tonight is a very, very tall order. Um, some of you Nick fans might now believe in miracles. This would take one. This would really take one tonight. And again, I don't know what their approach is going to be. I don't know what will happen if the game opens up sideways uh, and what they're going to do in terms of minutes with Brunson. We'll have to wait and see. how. But we do know this OG's out, and they are extremely limited against a team that goes very, goes nine quality deep. And is not afraid to play those guys major minutes. And they've all scored in the series. The Venture scored 46 points in each of the first two games. Now, um, I've told you about this thing that Bet Rivers is running during the playoffs. The NBA first basket bet and get. Here you go. So you think you know who's going to set the tone for tonight's game. Who's going to come out, knock down that first bucket? Well, make the bet at Bet Rivers and you'll pick up an extra bonus with the first bucket bet and get. Place a wager on who will make the first basket of, the, of any NBA playoff game. And when you do, Bet Rivers will give you a profit boost to use on another bet. See the Bet Rivers app for full details on the first bucket bet and get. Plus, our same game parlay will be up there tonight. When you wager on the same game parlay, you get those three boxes. If you match that box, you can pick up maybe up to $10,000 in bonus money. So it's like the typical Super Bowl box, okay? You get the box, and you get the box for free if you make a same-game parlay. So I put one up for you. Uh, the last one hit the other night, paid 6-1, to one, I think, 575-1 to one or 6-1. to one. Um, They asked me to put one up tonight. I couldn't put one up on the next time, and I apologize. I, 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 I could have put up a negative one on the Knicks. I didn't want to put up a positive one on the Knicks because I don't know how many minutes these guys are going to log tonight. I don't know if he calls the dogs off in the third quarter if they're not doing well. I, I, this is a game, from a Knicks standpoint, you stay away from. Hey, go in there with your heart and cheer and cheer and hope for the best, but uh, I wouldn't put any hard money uh, behind the Knicks this evening with the things as crazy as they are right now. No OG and a limping Brunson. That's that's a lot. Considering you're already down two other guys. And three if you count Randall, but we're not counting Randall now. But think of this series if right now you have Robinson and Bogdanovich and a healthy Brunson and a healthy OG. It's a different series. It's a different approach. Now you're down those guys and you're down OG and OG is a cog, a major, major cog. Hart took this team to one level. When the OG trade happened, he took the team to another level. Now, obviously, you know, Brunson coming in here and give, you know, the Knicks have gone and in front of our eyes, have been transformed from one of the worst basketball organizations in the NBA to one of the best. Yes, one of the best. They bring a player in here. He's not only useful, he really improves. Every piece they've brought in has been perfectly matched. This has been done in superb fashion. There's no other way to say it. Now, other NBA here. As I told you, Dallas is going to go as far as Luca's knee goes. Last night, he hit his threes. They get back in the series. They're 1-1. One, one. 
not surprised. If he holds up, they can win it. If his knee goes, they're going to they go. Now, Celts had that typical game that they seem to always have against an overmatched opponent at home in the Boston Garden where they have one of these rotten games where they just don't show up. 54 up at the half, and they get blown out in the second half. I mean, get their doors blown off by the Cavaliers. Lose in disgraceful fashion. But watch, they won't lose another game in a series now. It's just they have, they have this habit of just playing one really terrible game at home every series. The fascinating game tonight, and I have to admit, fascinating. After the Nick game tonight, Minnesota plays the biggest game in their history. And you know there's a lot of craziness going on at the T-Wolves right now. The A-Rod group, you know, is trying to get back control that they feel they had rightfully taken. If you read those stories, it looks like they have a pretty good argument. Um, Taylor clearly didn't want to get rid of the franchise because he probably thought, it was, and rightly so, that it's worth a lot more now. Um, they are, they have just shocked the NBA and have just dominated the champs. And they just, they just took them off the floor with their defense in game two. I mean, they just, they just took them completely out of their game and off the, they just took them out of the game. Goodbye. You can't play. We are just going to embarrass you with our defensive prowess. And they did. Now they're home. Can they do it again? Or do the champs and does the Joker show you what he's made of here? Now, this series is over if Denver loses tonight. But if Denver wins tonight, they can win this series even if they lose game four. Because they could easily go home, win game five, come back there, win game six, and go home, win game seven. They're capable of doing that. But it only works if they go and make the stand tonight. Now, logic would dictate they're going to make that stand tonight. You're going to ask Minnesota, at least I am, going to ask Minnesota to do that again. Hey, what I saw the other night, let me see you do it again. And let's see, there's some pressure. You know, the Joker just got another MVP. We know how well he's thought of, how much esteem the, the, the NBA world has for him and the basketball world has for him, and rightly so. He's earned that. But with that responsibility comes the responsibility of standing your ground. You expect a dominant player, an MVP player, to stand his ground tonight and make his stand in Minnesota. I want to see if he does that this evening against this defensive prowess of Minnesota, which didn't even have, wasn't even a full strength. So this is a fascinating thing to watch tonight, just to see. Just to see if Denver can make that stand as a champion. Do I think they, I kind of think they will. Let's see if they do, though. They still got to do it. I'll be fascinated tonight to watch that. And I haven't been fascinated by much in the playoffs other than the Knicks. And, you know, the first round of the Knicks series was by far the best series. We're not even close. And now this series has become compelling with everything that's going on in it too, in the injuries and everything else and the way these games have unfolded. But now, fascinated to see what Denver does, how they respond. Do they respond as champions? Do they act like champions with their backs against the wall? You know what? If they're, if they're the champions they're supposed to be, it doesn't matter where they play the game tonight. They can play it, you know, in any park they want, any stadium they want. As long as it's got two hoops, it'll be fine. doesn't matter where they play the game. If it's a game they have to show up in and, and they have to show up and play big, that's tonight. Let's see if they do it.
I think it's a really very interesting story to see now. You know, Minnesota jumps out and got game one. I said, all right, fine. Game two, you figured Denver was going to jump, you know, even the series and, you know, get re- wrestle command back. Instead, they got embarrassed, run out of the building. I mean, oh, you know, the numbers in that game, in those games were, they were scary. They really were. I mean, 106 to 80. Denver shot 9 of 30 from three. They shot 34% from the floor. They shot 30% from the three-point line. They turned the ball over 16 times. I mean, you just, you're stunned by what you're looking at. You really are. You're stunned by what you're looking at. You're like, how is this possible that they could do this? And we know what kind of defensive team they are. But still, when this happens, you you have to admit, you didn't expect it. And Jokic winds up with 16 points, 5 for 13, 5 for 13 from the floor. He had 16 rebounds and eight assists. He fills up the column like he always does, but 16 points. And they score 80 points in the game. 80 points. Murray goes three for 18. 0 for four from three. Porter goes four for 12, one for seven from three. Pope. Two for six. Look at these look at these shooting percentages. I mean, unbelievable. Now we'll see what happens. Towns had twenty seven. Edwards, who has had an incredible playoff at twenty seven and seven. After having a huge game one. So game three this evening. Knicks first, and we'll find out what kind of shape Brunson's in and how they're going to compensate for now another body being gone, a very important body in OG, who had, who had just an incredible game the other night in 27 minutes, 28 points. Made up for that first half slack and not having Brunson there. And then at 9.30 tonight, game three, the Nuggets and the T-Wolves, biggest game T-Wolves have ever played at home. Defending champs with their backs firmly against the wall. That's what you like to see in sports. Let's see how this let's see how this unfolds. How was that ball jumping out of uh, Yankee Stadium yesterday, huh? And the did the Astros ever need to hold on for a win? But you saw that ball hopping out of there, some of the home runs last night. That's the one thing I said about about Strowman. Strowman's a pro. And he'll have more good days than bad days. I don't think there's any question about it. But the way he pitches, he is going to give up home runs, especially, especially in Yankee Stadium. And he gave up a couple of long ones yesterday. That's going to happen to him. I mean, so far this year, he has pitched 42 innings and he's allowed seven home runs in 42 innings. Um, Last year, he did not allow a lot of home runs. Last year, he only allowed nine in 136 innings, which is a low number for him compared to other years. But this year, already seven. And at Yankee Stadium, he's very vulnerable to giving up home runs to left-handed hitters. There's no question about that. 
that's why he's going to be, I think, a more valuable pitcher on the road than he is at home. Because that friendly confines is a tough park for him. Now, a lot of good pitchers who are very successful and can go out there and throw six innings, seven innings, you know, now it's, you know, now it's for most of these starters with the new way they look at things. The way you look at the starter, folks, if he is in a special starting pitcher, you know they don't want him to face the lineup the third time. That's what it comes down to. Unless they have a very big lead or he has had a very hot hand that night and he's mowing everybody down. They don't want the starting pitcher to face the lineup the third time. That's their the essence. Hey, if that if you do your business, that gets you through five, can get you through six. But they get antsy when the top of the lineup comes up that third time on a lot of these starting pitches. They you know, goodbye. And that's how they judge it a lot of times. They don't want to face it. It, 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 they don't want the lineup to start for the third time against the same pitcher. And that's why you see a lot of these guys throwing five innings, five and two thirds, five innings, four and change some nights. And it's just the way of the world. It really is. And it's turned most of these guys into five to six if you look now, you rarely see guys who aren't top of the line pitchers going seven innings. It just doesn't happen. It's very rare unless the guy's in complete command or it's a very lopsided score. It just does not happen that much anymore. Most of the time it's somewhere between four and change and six and change. That's usually when the starting pitcher, you know, heads for the hills. But he's going to give up home runs at home. Judge hit a bomb last night, and all of a sudden, you know, he's got nine home runs. He's right there. So after the slow start that everyone was concerned about, Judge is right where you would expect him to be. I, you know, he's right there. Azuna's got 12. Henderson and Atani and Tucker have 11. Trout got off to a great start. He's obviously hurt. Um, Alonzo, Judge, have nine. Soto's got nine. I mean, so, and I told you before, I looked up how many times Manuel Maris hit home runs in the same game, 14, and 10 times back-to-back. Let's see how many times uh, Judge and Soto home in the same game. They did the other night, and Stanton home in the same game. You know, home runs come in bunches usually. That's just the way it is for home run hitters they usually hit their home runs in bunches. It's just why it's, it's, you get in the groove. You get hot, you get cold. That's basically the way the game's played. It's just, it's just always been that way. But he's right where you, you know, his RBIs are light. But, uh, you know, for him, not for a normal person, for him. 925 for a normal guy is ecstatic. But not, you know, not for him. But he's he's getting back to his normal numbers by the time you turn around, he's right there, you know. Soto's off to a terrific start with 933, a 333 batting average, a one, you know, with, uh, and, uh, the uh, OPS over one. And obviously his typical on-base percentage, you know, is right where you expect it. His career number is 422, which is outstanding. I mean, you look at the guys in history who are four guys, you know, guys who are – not telling Ted Williams, who not only had the great eye and walked a lot, but also was probably the best hitter of all time. He hit 340 for his career. So, you know, you know he's going to have a great on-base percentage. Mantle was amazing in those years. When Mantle was on the top of his game, his on-base percentage would be in the fives. High four is five. It was well over four for his career, well over four. He walked a lot. And, you know, he hit 298. He should have been a 300 hit a lifetime. I know, you know that's the only thing that ever bothered him. When I asked him once, what's the one thing that 
he looks at the back of the baseball card and it bothers him. He said, the only thing that bothered him was he says, I'm a, I was a 300 hitter lifetime. I should have finished a 300 hitter. The problem is those last four years when he could still knock the ball out of the park, even in his last year, when he hit 236, he hit 18 home runs on a bad team. He got pitched around a lot, but he still had a lot of power. He probably got up 400 times that year, and he hit 18 home runs on a bad team. That's not bad. A lot of guys could hang around a long time doing that. So he was still always going to hit the ball out of the ballpark. But those last four years, 65, 66, 67, 68, without those, he would not have hit 500 home runs, which wouldn't have mattered to him if he had hit 470 five or whatever, you know, somewhere around there, who cares? Versus 536. But those last four years, the batting average took him down to 298 for his career, which bothered him. Because he said, hey, when I was in my prime, I was a legitimate 300 hitter, which he was. The real man, 51 draw a line on because 63 64 wasn't a bad year he was hit hit 35 homers knocked in 111 runs hit 300 hit three home runs and knocked in eight runs in the world series um with 65 he was off to a great start but he missed so much of the year with the broken foot that he didn't have a full year. So if you take it, you draw a line 51 to 62 and just draw a line under there and look at the stats year by year. You'll see how, that's the brilliance of the player. Plus you'll see almost every one of those years, he was at least in the top five. A lot of times first or second in the MVP voting. And he was first, second or third, seven times in the MVP voting. Three ones, three twos out of three. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing when you think about it. And um, his numbers were outstanding from those years, because if you go 56, 57, he, you know, he hit 352, 365. I mean, that was a, for a slugger, those are big time batting averages. Soto is showing you some of that now with his overall numbers. I mean, you know, if you're going to hit 333, have a 430 on base percentage, have this kind of slugging percentage and knock in a bunch of runs, hit a bunch of home runs, have a 330 batting average, have these kinds of numbers overall. I mean, these are sensational numbers. They really are. Those are MVP type numbers, no question about it. The MVP could be Soto and Judge in the American League. Easily could. Could absolutely be those guys. You know, as soon as off to an incredible start, he's got uh, he's got a twelve homers, thirty eight RBIs, and Atani's off to a terrific start too. You know, Atani's got uh, eleven homers. He's got uh, twelve homers. You know, very good numbers. He's hitting 350. 12 homers, great batting average. I mean, his RBIs aren't as high as some of the other guys. He's got 27 RBIs. That's product of the team, though. And batting 355, so he's having a great year also as you would expect, as is Betts and Azuna and some other guys. So, but Judge and Soto could have a very interesting year when it comes to that. Uh, they might, might wind up in a battle for the MVP, which could be, make it an interesting situation. So game three this evening, that's what everyone's interested in. Um, can this Nick team shock the world this evening? I doubt it. I think you're asking for a miracle and how they're going to approach this, how they're going to approach it with Brunson, 
I guess he's going to play. I mean, who knows? If he, you know, listen, if he's healthy enough to play, he plays. See, if they think, A, we'll have to wait and we'll see how he's doing in the game, if that were the case, I'd give him tonight off and bring him back Sunday and just play the game the best I can with the guys I have and give him the rest. If it was going to help him a lot, I would do that. I don't know if that's the case. Let the doctors decide that. We'll see if he's in the game this evening. Um, we'll be with you after the game tonight, as we are after these games. This game might be a quickie because there might not be much to talk about, especially if they call the dogs off. See, if you're if you're Carlisle tonight, what you want them to do is look down the bench in the third quarter and say, all right, we're out of here. We'll see you Sunday. And everyone can start preparing for Sunday. They can give some guys some needed rest and get ready for game four. That could happen tonight. We'll see if it does. Enjoy your evening. We'll see you after the game.